Every single product or every single company that, that I've launched, and there's been three of them, have solved the, the founder's problems. Welcome to the Product Market Fit Show, brought to you by Mistral, a seed stage firm based in Canada. I'm Pablo. I'm a founder turned VC. My goal is to help early stage founders like you find product market fit. So, Matt, welcome to the Product Market Fit Show uh, for everyone listening, Matt is a serial entrepreneur. He's he's founded not one, not two, but three companies. And so the the topic of today's episode is how to come up with an idea. Now, coming up with an idea is is really hard and is a really painful part of many for many founders because it's that part where you're not able to just put in more effort and get more output. And I remember for myself kind of struggling with this. I, I knew I wanted to start something. I knew I wanted to be a founder, but I just didn't know how to come up with an idea. And and Matt's done it three times now. And each of these startups, and we'll talk about each one individually, has you know no notes. Your first company reached millions of users, Ascent, Compliance, a second company is doing $100 million in revenue as a unicorn. And millions, your current company is less than a year old and it's raised $10 million. So, you know, millions all over the place, uh, which which is a good place to be as a founder. So so anyways, Matt, you know, with that introduction, maybe we'll, we'll just start with the first company, No Notes. I think it was started at some point, kind of late 2000s, 2007, 2008. And I'd love to get the, the origin story, right? Like the, just really the lead up to coming up with the idea and then we'll we'll dive into you know how you really came up with it and and how it uh, how it developed over time a little bit. Sure, and and thanks for having me. It's a it's it's a pleasure to be here and an awesome show. The so I have three anecdotes to share because it, it's been a wild entrepreneurial journey for the last kind of fifteen years. So so for for no notes, what happened was the the Facebook ad platform was emerging. And I saw a way that for a a super low cost, you could reach literally every student in in North America. And if you remember at the time, you could only get into Facebook or you could only be on the platform if you had a .edu address. And over time, they they opened it up, but it it was highly student-focused, even when they opened it up to the general public. And they launched this ad product. And my thought was, okay, if you can reach every student in North America because they're on Facebook and they're spending so much time there, and you can literally do it for a penny a click. What's a great product? Can I invent something to sell to them? And I was out one night with some friends that worked in the transcription industry. And I thought, well, maybe we can automate note taking in classes for undergrad. So, so that was the original thesis. But it was also driven by a, a, a move in technology and a fact that a new ad platform had just emerged. And I tested that thesis, built no notes, where undergraduates could get basically all of their lecture notes transcribed if they used a, a voice recorder or, or captured the audio. And it turns out that that wasn't a great idea. It was more that people doing PhD research, master's research, and faculty who were doing kind of high-level academic interviews and, and, and research needed that recorded and transcribed. And that turned out to be where the company kind of hit product market fit, uh, scaled to, to millions of users, and has been in business for 11 years, kind of like in the million-dollar run rate and it's not a huge venture back company, never raised any outside capital, just kind of bootstrapped it to, you know, where it is today. So, so that, that was kind of entrepreneurial journey number one and how no notes kind of was more, was more built on the back of a, a tech trend and a new marketing channel that was like, wow, I can reach all these people so targeted, so cheap. Uh, I need, I need to develop a product for the space. The first piece is that, right, is it's one thing kind of looking back now to summarize it in, here's this new, and it sounds super easy, right? Like, here's this new platform. It's Facebook. You can reach many, many people easily. And I jumped on it, right? At the time, like 2008 Facebook, I mean, it was a four-year-old company. I think I'm pretty confident. I thought it was just like kind of some some joke, like MySpace would be, right? Like, and and yet you you had this idea that you know this thing was real or at least worth testing because it's not easy to spot a trend when it's happening. It's so easy looking backwards, right? And even like we think about Bitcoin today or whatever, you still have different opinions on it. In the future, someone's going to be right, someone's going to be wrong. NFTs are another one, right? Like 
And looking back, it's just so obvious, right? Can we jump into that and like, how did you notice Facebook at first and what you saw about it that was that was interesting that made you start even digging into and having this thesis of, okay, it's only .edu. Okay, I can reach a lot of students. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be targeted. It's going to work. It, it was super. It was super quantitative in that you, you use their ad product and, and the earliest version of their, their ad product was built right off of the back of Google AdWords. So you, you would say, I want to target students in Chicago. And it would literally give you a number. It would say there was a million students in Chicago. Okay, well, that's pretty interesting. How much to run this ad against those million students? And then it, it, would, it would come up with this estimated CPM cost per million views of like four bucks. And it's like, okay, well, I don't need a high conversion rate with you know, those million students at $4 to sell a $10 product or to sell a $20 product. So, so it was more just deconstructing the math and the conversion rates based on what that platform was offering. And I, and I guess the, the closest anecdote for today's market is, okay, well, TikTok literally just kind of launched their ads product, which looks exactly like Facebook. So you can log into TikTok and say, all right, well, if I want to reach millennials uh, with my product, here's the CPM and here's the conversion rate. And if, and if you're a cool entrepreneur that's developing products for millennials or younger, it's like, hey, there's, there's your first ad channel that's got the lowest CPM, probably the highest impact, and start running your A-B tests and start seeing what kind of clicks you can get. Social so well understood. That new platform pops up and it, Clubhouse was another one, right? Where it's like, oh, wow, I've got to be the first on Clubhouse. i got to get my, my name and like, you know, whatever, and maybe build a group because I need to be first in on new social channel. Like back then, Facebook's kind of like pioneering, you know, these these real social networks. A lot of people looked at Facebook and they're like, oh, I'll build a profile and connect with friends. You look to Facebook and you're like, let's explore their, you know, their, their, their ad, ad products. features and their ad products and, and do the math on it. Like what was happening? Had you already played around with like Google ads? You were already doing other marketing or like what led you to do that? Well, in the entrepreneurial journey, my, my first ever company was a boxing gym. And the the cost to run that gym was about $8,000 a month. And my grandparents had co-signed on the loan. So failure was not an option. I had to figure out how to make eight grand a month. And Google AdWords turned out to be the best channel for that. So I was fairly familiar with put in a, put in a dollar and sell $10 worth of memberships or you know, put in a thousand dollars and sell four thousand dollars worth of membership. So, like, return on ad spend is, is just something that every entrepreneur really has to get a good grasp on. And, and we're dealing with that right now at Millions, where it's okay. We have three hundred athletes on the platform. We need to efficiently run, call it a million dollars worth of ads against those three, three, three hundred, four hundred athletes. How do we get the best return on ad spend? And, and what's the breakdown? And what ads resonate? So, for for any kind of early stage founder trying to find product market fit, you also have to find product market and channel fit. And and for for No Notes, the channel was, was Facebook ads uh, all day. It, it, the, the CPMs were so low, you could you could acquire customers and scale really quickly. For for the boxing gym, the, the best ad channel we ever had, and it was the newest one, was was uh, doing Groupon and group buying. That that turned out to be like like a silver bullet. You just fill your gym up with one Groupon campaign. So for each founder kind of listening, it's, it's experimenting with different channels. And th I've played with the Spotify ad product. And that's, again, take your brand to thousands and thousands of listeners in a pretty cool and unique format. And you can do it for a really low CPM. So if you're doing a consumer good play, you may want to play with Spotify ads, TikTok ads, because those are the newest, lowest CPMs. Google and Facebook are going to be pretty saturated. And then... In uh, we're currently playing and like literally going back to the future and buying digital billboard space in like Times Square for a super low CPM. And then you get all your derivative content assets and make your, your company look huge because, oh my God, you just got featured in, in, in Times Square billboards. Like how big's your company? Like the thing about starting a tech company is you, you tend to be going, there's at least a new product, if not an entire new market, right? And so there's this kind of extra risk that you're taking on. When you start a services company and you think about product market fit, right? You, you have a new product, you have to see, you know, is there product market fit? New market, of course, you need to figure out, is the market even real, right? Services company uh, or traditional company, like if you sell coffees, I mean, people want coffee. So the product market fits there. It's more around the economics and the branding and, and different things that, that are risk. It's not the product market fit. Like you're a young founder, right? You, you're struggling to come up with an idea. What do you think about saying, you know, screw it. Let's start like some simple kind of services business. 
could be whatever, could be lawn mowing, could be some sort of gym. Not that it's simple, but it's like the product market fit element is the in, isn't in there. The coming up with an idea piece isn't there. You just have to pick one and, and really execute. And it lets you get into it. Cause you know, just thinking back, had you not done the boxing gym, had you not gone into AdWords on Google, maybe you wouldn't really have seen Facebook and, and everything you could offer. So, so I, I mean, when we talk about coming up with ideas as kind of our, our central theme of what we're discussing, every single product or every single company that, that I've launched, and there's been three of them, have solved the, the founder's problem. So in, in No Notes, I, I kind of built what I would have liked in undergrad. So that, that was pretty straightforward. I knew I would have bought it. Uh, so at least there was, there was a customer base of one. And I'm not that unique. There's lots of people like me. There's lots of people who would have either rather skipped the lecture and have somebody record it and transcribe it altogether because they're, they were drunk the night before, or at least would have liked, you know, for the academic people that added kind of benefit. When, when we talk about Ascent, and Ascent's probably the, the most relevant to, to this audience because Ascent raised $220 million in venture and private equity funding as a unicorn. It, it took 11 years to build. It was a real journey. But that started with my co-founder, John, starting a, a, as a junior consultant at a, at a supply chain data management company and realizing there was so much room for automation. And the clients were buying these consulting projects. And most of that consulting work could have been automated with some basic technology, with a, a, an email campaign manager, with a dashboard, with a mini CRM. And, and we kind of set out and he was solving his own problem. He's like, I'm a consultant. We're selling these, these consulting projects. So it's all manual. He's like, guaranteed I can sell this SaaS if we build it. So again, he was scratching his own itch and the itch within his company that was super, super transparent. It was like, if I build this, I'll, I'll sell it. And, and that's how he convinced, uh, he convinced me and, and our technical co-founder Rob to basically drop what we were doing and start this new supply chain data management company with no expertise, experience, or funding. It's like, all right, well, hey, John is a very convincing guy. He's got a great idea and he knows he can sell it. So, hey, why not? Why not do that? And and then that that turned into kind of a you know a billion dollar plus company over over eleven years. So, and, and then I guess the third one, millions. Uh, I, I had a lot of friends from the boxing days who were professional athletes. And in the same week, I, I I saw four of them post merch designs, but they couldn't ship, they couldn't print. They 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 all, without exception, were going to go to the local print office, print off a shirt for me, and then go to the post office, package it up, and send it to me. And I was like, if this is how pro athletes view e-commerce, there's an opportunity here. So for each company that I, I've ever started, it's been directly addressing a problem that the founder had. In in no notes, you know, I, I didn't want to take notes. In in millions, I, I couldn't buy my friends' merchandise who were in Washington, Ohio, and Montreal at the time. And then and and then for Ascent, it was a, the guy in the trenches selling consulting contracts, being like, "This is broken; it needs to be automated." So those are those are the three anecdotes where you know solve your own problem first because you know it exists and you know at least there's a market of one or two this idea of going out through life and looking for problems looking for things that are frustrating in your own life and then going out to solve them is pretty common is that something you're you're kind of constantly doing and then the other piece you know to that is if you are like or there are a bunch of other things that you built that you know ended up kind of not really going anywhere i have to assume that Getting all these ideas, some are good and some not so much. When you think about almost any good company, I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't think of any founder stories where one of my friends started a company, or, or you know, most of the anecdotes that I that I've read about are, are people just looking to start businesses. It's more people starting, seeing problems or seeing trends and jumping on them. Like Amazon got started because Jeff Bezos saw the internet growing at you know, compounding at a hundred percent, growing at, you know, a thousand percent year over year and said, what's a category I can start, you know, look no further than our, our local Shopify in Ottawa, where Toby's trying to sell snowboards and then realizes that there's this huge problem to be able to, to, to spin up an online store. I think the best businesses are, are founders and entrepreneurs, either jumping on trends, just seeing something that's, you know, super obvious to, to them and maybe not to everybody else and, or just solving their own problem. And, so let's let's get through that story then. Um, you mentioned consultant friend told you you know he's doing a bunch of stuff that you figured uh, could be automated. Can we dive into the details? Like what exactly is the work he's doing with what sorts of companies? Sure. So so Ascent 
if you, if you go on the website, is the global leader in supply chain data management. And what that what that means is, or, or what the original concept for the company was, uh, John, John was my best friend too, and we lived together, and and, and literally the, the idea for the company came from being, again, drinking uh, on the way down to party, like downtown Ottawa, when I think I was 25 at the time. John's working as a consultant, and, and what they were doing is they would analyze a bill of material, and a bill of material is essentially a recipe for a product. So think of a recipe like, chocolate chip cookies, you've got some some flour, you've got some sugar, you got some chocolate chips, and you bake it at certain temperature for so, so long and out pops a cookie. When you're doing that, each part and component manufacturer has to provi- provide the the end user, the, the end customer with data. And that data can be compliance driven, that data can be sourcing driven, trade driven. And at the time, the what John was doing is, is his company would call up every supplier and ask them for their compliance data. And then they would win another contract and they would call the same suppliers, ask them for the same data for just a different contract that they, they had sold. What is compliance data just for the listeners? Like Compliance data is like a, a document saying that these specific hazardous substances aren't in the parts and components that I'm selling you. So there's no phthalates in the plastic that, you know, are going to leach into the water if it's a water bottle, as an example. Over time, we explained the, the platform to all different types of materials, all different compliance data types. But in the beginning, it was just like one simple data type. It was around the the, the reach compliance directive in, in Europe. So I don't want to bore your, your listeners with, with the nuances. But again, it was just manual phone calls and ma- manual calling up suppliers and asking them for information and sending it over email. And it was like, this is so painful and it, 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 it's so ripe for automation. John's consulting company wasn't going to build software. They, they, they would have handicapped themselves if they automated the process because they charge less consulting fees. So, so at, at some level, John was putting some of the consulting people out of, <laughs> out of the job if we were successful. And so, you know, you're, you're in this car, you're, you're drinking. He says this, you know, you quickly have this conversation around, oh, we should automate this, right? I think maybe... Thousands and thousands of those conversations happen every single day and, and probably very few of them, if any, turn to, you know, an ascent compliance like, you know, business. So what, what, like what happened after? What's the follow up? What are some of the few next steps you take to, you know, crystallize this and, and really whether it's validated or really kind of shape this idea into something more tangible? So, so the next question was, well, how many companies kind of fit this profile, John? And th- 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 there's like a funny like in my life, one of the funnier conversations I've ever had was with uh, our friend Adrian, who I think you know, who's a co-founder of of Canvas Pop, DNA Eleven, great entrepreneur. And John's like, it's infinitely scalable, and it's like, no, John, there's there's not that many companies in the world. And and he's just like, nope, uh, we can sell it. To, we can, at some level, we're going to be able to sell this software to every company in the world. And it's like, all right, well, hey, John has John has conviction that uh, there's a big enough market here, so that's good news. John went one step for, forward. He's just like, I'll prove it. Uh, I'll, I'll sell this uh, for you know six figures to a, an aerospace company in the next in the next quarter. So at that at that point, you know, again, John's a great salesman. He's my best friend. It's like, hey, if he's got this much conviction. Um, let's loop in a, a technical co-founder and build an MVP. And hey, it, the worst case is we spent a couple months building a website, some marketing collateral, and an MVP of, of you know supply chain data management software. Hey, if we lose two or three months of our lives and, and, and took the shot, well, that's not that big of an investment. I mean, it, we were all super young. I was I was twenty five or twenty six. So it's like, yeah, let's do it. And we we kind of strapped in uh, Rob being the technical co-founder worked with John and I on kind of requirements, wireframing, and, and just coded. And then I worked on the website. I built our marketing collateral. And then John got together a sales plan and put together the first deck, put together the first webinar. I guess four months, five months after that initial cab ride, launch an MVP to the world, do our first webinar, and then close our first six-figure contract in aerospace, like John said. <laughs> and and that was like kind of the seed capital to say that we should keep going and 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 we should keep we should keep building this. And what was I mean today? Ascent is a big company, you know, fully featured product. What was the MVP like? Like when you thought about the root of the problem or the first thing to solve, what did you build at first? Yeah, it was a campaign manager. So send a campaign out to these suppliers. So you would upload a supplier list and you would upload a bill of material. And some of it was pretty manual, like in the background, but. We were proud of the product we shipped. Looking back, if you if I showed if I pulled up the design here, you'd be like, "What is this?" It's like 
Windows 3.1 looking, but it had a campaign manager. So that basic workflow, it, it had a supplier portal. So suppliers could open their portal, upload their compliance data, and then at some level would roll it up to the bill of material level. So that, that, that was the MVP. And that was enough to, to, to convince these, this, well, in a, originally the, the aerospace company that this would save a lot of time and effort. And it would probably save two full-time employees worth of effort, which validates or, or rationalizes the 100K or whatever the, the, the contract was, 100K spent. And, and they, 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 they did it. They cut us the purchase order. And just to be clear, what what year was was this in that Ascend was founded? 2010. I mean, automation continues to be super popular today. Automating workflows is, is still a big deal. But, you know, you would argue you were like, especially with these kind of maybe more old school industries, like that's another trend that you were writing, right? If you think about the first one being, you know, social media driven ads, uh, this one, you know, workflow automation was that it was at the very beginning there was a lot of companies that were still doing things in, in analog ways you you would call it the sassification of basically everything and and what happened was salesforce kind of pioneered it and, and that's in sales where the sales budget's always the biggest budget for the most part like in most companies so for salesforce it was yeah let's build crm and automate after that then you got kind of the hubspots and the marketos of the world doing sassification of marketing then you have like the work days and the ERP systems kind of doing sassification of, of, of finance and of HR. Nobody had gotten to compliance yet because, you know, truth be told, compliance is kind of geeky and boring. And, you know, it, it's not like a, a revenue driver for the company. So for right. us, nobody had really built the sales force of, of supply chain data management. So we... we we were too young and and kind of naive to, to even really realize the satisfaction of everything was happening. So in hindsight, yeah, we, we jumped on that trend. But at the time, it was more like see problem, solve problem. We weren't really trend focused in that one. And, and it wasn't until five years in where we raised venture capital. And it was like, at that point, we started getting much more sophisticated. We had a an expert CEO that we had brought in who, who's, who's incredible. And that's kind of the reason the company has gotten to it, it, where it is. But for the first five years, it was more just like solve these problems for companies and, and we're going to be well rewarded with our annual recurring revenue contracts. From there, now we fast forward to your latest company, Millions. You spoke a little bit about what that story was like, but maybe let's let's jump into that. Like, before you came up with millions, kind of, were you still at Ascend? Like, where were you? What were you doing at that time? Yeah, I, I was. I was VP of growth at Ascend, and VP of growth in a in a fast moving, high growth company with a great executive pay package, and uh, you know, great executive pay and stock options and bonuses. And again, maybe because I'm a masochist, but. I, I saw this problem and was like, okay, I got to do another startup around it. Uh, Ascent is an amazing company. It's going to be a great public company. Uh, I, I, I love Ascent more than anybody. And, but, but after 11 years, it was like, okay, I need to, I need to solve problems. I need to move fast. And, and w what happened was, uh, again, I saw four, four of our professional athlete friends post, posting merch. And I talked about kind of, kind of starting out to solve that, that e-commerce and merchandising problem. Again, Adrian and my brother and I were smoking cigars and in my, in my cigar lounge in my condo. And we saw the trends that were happening with online video. So, so specifically Twitch and, and Cameo where video technology is, is just becoming widely adopted in different formats. So doing watch parties and watching sports with your, your favorite athletes would be such a unique and amazing experience. We thought we could democratize that through using the, the latest state of the art video technology. And we thought the workflow of Cameo doing personalized videos was so cool, but it wasn't really well applied to athletes specifically because Cameo is more for celebrities and actors to be in their character and give you a birthday shout out. Whereas athletes want to talk about their journey. They want to talk about their training. They want to talk about or give inspiration to, to young athletes who are, you know, thinking of quitting soccer or, or quit, thinking of quitting boxing and be like, no, stick with it. So we, we decided to, to, to be laser focused on, on sports and athletics, give athletes the tools to connect best with their audience and their fans. And it's been a, it's been a great journey so far. It's been five months and we have uh, literally thousands of athletes signed up to, to, to transact and, and operate on the platform. 
We've raised $10 million from Volition Capital, which is a great VC. And this is this is just really exciting. It's combining sports and technology, my favorite things. It's uh... So just to back up a bit, like originally you, you said you had some like friends, you knew people in boxing. And is it right you ordered merchandise and kind of saw how, how broken the process was? Is that what happened? They weren't even transacting. I tried to order merchandise and, and I couldn't do it. They, they were literally going to go to a print shop, print off a single t-shirt or like a run of whatever, then go to the post office, then send it out. Meanwhile, this guy's like, one of the guys was about to fight for like a WBC title. And he was, it's like, you can't go to the post office and ship me this out, man. You got to be in the gym. You, we can take all of this off off your plate if, uh, if we build this product right. So the original concept was e-commerce and merchandising. And you're probably asking that. You've already brought up Shopify. Why didn't you just put them on that? And literally, I, I had asked them because, you know, we all, we all know the founders. I, I asked both the athletes and Shopify, do you have a sports-specific division? They didn't. And the athletes, I, I sent them the link and they're like so overwhelmed. They're like, I can't do this. <laughs> uh, so we kind of set out to, to make it more of a platform and a lot easier to get up and running and transact. Now, at this point, you've done, you know, three companies, let's say. And so... Did you, when you saw this problem, did you do kind of like formal customer discovery? Did you talk to like 20 athletes to see how they were doing it? How quickly did you move to, okay, this is a problem. I got to build stuff. It's funny. Adrian and I kind of fought on this where he's like, well, let's see if we can sell four shirts and let's see if we can do like use Zoom and do some of these calls to see if a watch party is even feasible. And at, at, at that point through kind of 11 years of entrepreneurship and pattern recognition and being able to kind of front front invest uh, with my own capital, I was just like, nah, let's just do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're, we're just going to go all in. So I, I invested about a million dollars of my own money on, on a thesis. And the thesis was athletes are going to want to use this product and fans are, are going to want to transact. And luckily, I think I was right. I mean, the, the first <laughs> day, right so the first, far. I mean, the right. first day we, we did a few thousand dollars in revenue. And it's like, hey, we, we launched product day one, you know, you got thousands of dollars in revenue and, and and that trend didn't slow down. So, you know, in the first four months, we've gotten thousands of customers and, and, and thousands of dollars in revenue. So it's like, hey, I, I guess we're onto something. So all the unit economics are making sense. So I, I guess for early entrepreneurs, the, the advice is definitely go out and validate it. And do some customer discovery, like build it and they will come statement is, is highly risky. But I mean, hey, if it's your third one and and what you're investing, you're not afraid to kind of lose it, then then kind of go ahead. It would be my guidance or at least what I did. One of the things I, I feel like when I, when I talk to you is that coming up with ideas is pretty effortless. Like it's natural. It just kind of happens in an ordinary course of, of business. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, if you think about it, it's not like you have an idea a day. I mean in terms of these three ideas we're talking about, it was you had one and then two years later, you had another one and 10 years later, you had another one. But it, it's not like you sought out to build, right? These ideas kind of came. I guess the question is like, what's your views on on how natural being a founder should be? My, thought, my thoughts are this, is you have to be able to apply the leading, kind of the leading edge of technology to a problem that you're having. So if you don't know what's possible, if you don't know, how to build a video product and the workflow associated that with that to connect fans and athletes, you're never really going to be able to, to, to notice that there's a, there's a problem. So, you know, we could see what was happening in video and then apply that to the, the, the athlete set. The, the, the key component is risk aversion. I, I mean, I, I got my grandparents to co-sign on a, on a loan for a boxing gym and, you know, that's high risk. Like imagine, imagine a, 23 year old bankrupts his grandparents like that's like that's really bad i i, I so starting companies you you've got to be highly risk tolerant and like even on millions i put in a million bucks <laughs> it's like you gotta be you, you gotta like that's the, the, the most risky asset class there is probably is, is venture capital <laughs> that's why it's called venture capital and i did that i, I did that pre like vc I, I did it in the seed stage uh but hey, I was betting on myself and betting on a, an area that I knew pretty well. So I think the way to get ideas is to be able to connect the dots between what's happening either in, in technology or a trend to, to some problem that you're experiencing personally. 
And then there's, if you're not risk averse, you shouldn't be a founder. I mean, it's, it's a roller coaster and you've experienced this. Uh, I mean, I've experienced this. I, I'd be lying if I didn't say that there was, you know, one afternoon specifically where I was crying to myself in my condo, like tears, like face in hand, uh, weeping and, and like, you know, you, it's not easy, but it, it's super rewarding. So, so, you know, coming up with ideas is basically taking and connecting dots between what's possible and, and, and where that technology could be applied and hasn't been applied yet. And then to, is ever, can anybody be a founder? It's like, if your risk tolerance is really, really low and you can't sleep at night because you're taking a certain amount of risk, like maybe joining an early team uh, is probably a better fit. Let me ask you another thing about coming up with an idea. So say I'm somebody and I'm, I'm risk tolerant and I'm buying Bitcoin, I'm buying real estate. Like I know I could take risk. There's this other there's other way to do it, and people I think have mixed views. I'm curious on yours, which is maybe you pick an industry that you either care about, you're passionate about, whatever, and you start just learning about the industry and maybe even doing like semi customer discovery. Like, especially if you're younger and you're closer to being a student, you call up some people in the industry and you say, like, yeah, I'm a student, I'm doing research, and da da da. And you just start to learn about what their day to day is like. And you start to see what the problems are until you find a problem that you think is, you know, worth solving. And then you go through kind of classic customer discovery and so on. Like, do you think there's anything wrong with this more structured model of coming up with an idea? Anything fake about it? Or is that also a valuable path? It's not what I would recommend. I'd recommend getting your hands dirty. And if, if, if to use your example, I would start in a startup in that space uh, or I would start in a big company in that space. And, and figure out the actual pain and, and the actual problems they're experiencing. So, you know, if, if you're looking to, to start working in sports and you just want to just examine it from the outside in, you're not really going to feel the pain that, uh, or, or see the, the actual day to day problems or where automation could take over or, or the latest SaaS product. It's really tough just interviewing people and we've experienced this with new product introduction at, at ascent before like if you ask your customer what they want there's the famous ford line like ask if i asked my customers what they wanted they would have said a faster horse not a car because they don't know what's possible in in the realm of technology and and your customers may not know that you can solve xyz this way and that happened at ascent all the time it's Love it. Yeah. So I, if you're an entrepreneur or want to be entrepreneur and you're stuck, just join a startup. Join a startup that's doing something that you're interested in. And at least, you know, you, you start doing stuff. And I think that's that's the key is, is just it's, always it's the, be it's the, the best way to learn. And, and that's where you get closest access to the rock face, where like when you're in a startup in a small team, you're wearing so many hats, you're, you're, you're moving fast. And, and that's where you really kind of... <laughs> You get to experience everything. So that that's my recommendation is learn a startup. You learn the nuances of it and then you're ready to start your own. Awesome. Well, listen, Matt, we'll, we'll stop it there. You know, just to, to recap, you've taken us through how to come up with not one, not two, but three ideas, quite an impressive journey. And, and really we've, we've taken a deep dive into how to come up with an idea and I think we all uh, understand, you know, your perspective about just solving problems, really being on top of technology and trying to solve your own pain point. So thanks a lot for that. It's been a pleasure. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me and uh, look forward to the next episodes as well. It's a great show. Thank you so much for listening all the way through. It's been a pleasure having you here. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode.